One of their main purpose was to secure a waterfront site for tourists in 1966. The Valley Camp freighter was then decommissioned and consequently the purchase was made and in 1968 on July the 4th the ship was tugged across Lake Superior right here to Sault Ste. Marie. Hello everyone and welcome back to Total Michigan. I am your host Cliff Duvinois. If you paid attention to the episode that we did with Captain Scott with the famous Sulak boat tours, he made a comment about how they do some of the tours in French. And of course, I hear this and I want to be a part of it. But anyways, we're lucky because right next door to the famous Sulaks is the Valley Camp. And this is a nationally recognized museum, one of the must-stop points if you're going to be making a trip to Sault Ste. Marie. And today we've got the honor and the privilege of talking to not only the French speaker for the tours of the famous Sulaks, but also a curator and a tour guide here at the Valley Camp. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Paul Sabarin. Hey, thank you very much, Cliff. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here in your company and to be able to share with your viewers and listeners all of the historical aspect of Sault Ste. Marie. Yes, can I, so I got to say I love how you say that in French. So let's get that right off the bat. I love that. And I really, there's so much here that we need to dive into because I'm learning so much about Sault Ste. Marie. But before we get into that, Paul, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. So where are you from? Where did you grow up? I was born in northern Quebec in a small community, which was a mining community. And then my parents were there moving from Ontario back in the 30s. And from there, I then relocated with the family back in Ontario, went to school in English at university. Okay. And as soon as I graduated and I was in Toronto, then I took a beeline for Montreal. And I studied in recreation. And I was the assistant director of recreation in, on the island of Montreal. Then I also went to Hydro-Quebec in the James Bay Project as a recreation director. After that, then I decided after three years, I'd warm up. So I canoed down the Mississippi <laughs> okay. for months and met this beautiful young lady in Marquette. That's how these stories we always are start. are celebrating our 47th anniversary. Congratulations. That's Thank huge. you very much. With our three daughters, uh, Simone, Rachel, and Adele, and five grandchildren. So, being here in Sault Ste. Marie, she was born and raised here in Sault Ste. Marie. Then I went to work across the river, I should say across the St. Mary's River, on the International Bridge with the Ministry of Culture and Recreation. Ministry of Culture and Recreation dealt with naturally with recreation, sports, and fitness, but also it dealt with the culture side of the ministry, which was art, literature, libraries, museums, and I emphasize museum because that was one aspect of my work that I really, really enjoyed. 30 years of working nice. over at, in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. A good friend of mine who, at that particular time, was the executive director of the Sioux Historic Sites, the owner of the museum ship Valley Camp, Richard Brawley, and also part owner at this point here, and also with this famous Sulak boat tour. So Richard says, said, Paul says, uh, why don't you come in? Okay. I retired on a Friday, and on the Monday, I was here on the Valley Camp. So I think I had two days of uh, semi-retirement. And I say semi-retirement because I put in three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And the rest of the time, I'm free to do as I wish. I enjoyed working here on the museum ship Valley Camp. What is it? Because you, you said before about you know being involved with museums and you really liked it. What in particular drew you to that type of work? Well, it was the provincial government, and it was ministry, and it was rec recreation. This was my particular background. And with that, then, 
I had applied 10 years, three times, and finally ended up here in Sault Ste. Marie with that particular position. It was a covering an area that also dealt with francophones. My position was a designated bilingual position. So I had to be able to speak both languages. Sure. So English is my second language. And I know that uh, it was somewhat difficult at first trying to pronounce the TH. If I say my mother and my brother yeah, and all of this here and the feather, so this is when I'm doing tours, I usually then let people know that, uh, yes, this is going to be my accent. But nevertheless, anyway, it was then a good opportunity to be able to be involved here with the museum ship Bella Camp because in the 70s, and to be more exact, in 78, 77, the Edmund Fitzgerald sank in 1975. Indeed. It sank in Canadian water, and it was the province of Ontario through the archaeological branch, and I was with the regional services branch, and we had our archaeologists in the office, and I pretty much had to send a lot of briefing notes dealing with the recovery of the bell from the Edmund Fitzgerald. So then I got to know pretty much the history, and as a matter of fact, tie in with this here, Gordon Lightfoot. When yes. I was in Toronto, in Yorkville, back in the 60s, Gordon Lightfoot was in Yorkville performing. So for our audience, I, I want to say that for this particular conversation here, Gordon Lightfoot wrote a song about the Edmund Fitzgerald. And not only that, but he recently passed away. This is definitely uh, yeah, a loss with Gordon Lightfoot and... The legend lives on from the Chippewa on down on a big lake they call Kichigumi. This is the start of the song itself. Right. There's also an obituary that I took out from the newspapers and all of the literature, and it's posted right here. Sure. At the ship, because we have here inside the museum ship Vela Camp three artifacts or three debris from the Edmund Fitzgerald. Lifeboat number one, only half of it, because it was ripped in half. Lifeboat number two, it was found on the shore on the Ontario side, and a portion of a life ring. And we have a beautiful display about the Edmund Fitzgerald. This was one of my first projects that I was able to accomplish here sure. when I arrived here. And thanks to the Michigan Council of Arts and Cultural Affairs, they provided the funding for brand new displays, all of the names of the 29 sailors, what they did, and also being able to talk about the dive that was done on the Edmund Fitzgerald by the Woodrush and Captain Jimmy Oba, talked about the Calypso and the one time that they were here on Lake Superior. Right. So, the whole background of the Edmund Fitzgerald can be seen here at the Museum Ship Valley Camp. And as well, the bell, when it was retrieved, was retrieved from the bottom and replaced by another bell. And that bell is now at the Great Lake Shipwreck Historical Society. Every November 10th, it is rung 30 times. And I can ah. still feel the shiver in my back when I was able and invited to ring it for the Captain McSorley. Yes. So let's let's unpack a little bit here about because I know that I've I've said several times that we're talking about Valley Camp, but this is Sault Ste. Marie historic sites. So why don't you talk to us when, when, when people see the flyer or the brochure for the historic sites, what, is that in, what does that entail? What does that include? Okay, well, Sault Ste. Marie itself was founded as a permanent mission in 1668 by Father Jacques Marquette. Which makes it one of the oldest cities. It is the oldest city in the state of Michigan. I say city, one has to be qualifying it because it is a permanent established mission, Roman Catholic. There you go. And consequently also, there's also the 
comment that it is the third oldest in the U.S., but one has to make that particular comment also. It is with St. Augustine and Santa Fe, the third oldest permanent established mission where masses Roman Catholic were held. Right. So in 1968, the city of Sault Ste. Marie was celebrating its tricentennial, 300 years, and the board under Don Gary Sr. then established the creation of the site and the creation also of all of the activities. One of their main purpose was to secure a waterfront site for tourists. Right. And consequently, the word got around and in Duluth in 1966, the Valley Camp freighter was then decommissioned. And consequently, the purchase was made. And in 1968, on July the 4th, the ship was tugged across Lake Superior right here to Sault Ste. Marie. Also, in addition to that, the Sioux Historic Site was able to acquire the Tower of History. The Tower yes. of History is one particular site that, so you say, Sioux, S-A-U-L-T, Historic Sites, plural. So the Tower of History was a building that was then built in 66 by the Diocese of Sault Ste. Marie and Marquette. We also contract with the River of History Museum. It is a separate organization. It is referred to as the Sault Ste. Marie Foundation for Culture and History. Okay. It is a beautiful site, the history going from the Ice Age all the way to our 1910 governor and all the times in between. It is located on the main street, Ashman Street, and beautiful site where you can visit all three sites for a deluxe combination ticket that can be purchased at the Valley Camp, the Tower of History, or the River of History. Nice. For our audience, we're going to take a quick break to thank our sponsors when we come back. We're going to learn a little bit more from Paul, exactly what you can expect when you come here and how you can make the best of your visit should you choose to come. We'll see you after the break. Hey, if you are enjoying these great interviews, just take a moment and go to TotalMichigan.com slash join, and you can get these episodes sent directly to your inbox because there's a lot more great stories coming. See you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Total Michigan. I'm your host, Cliff Duvenois. Today, I'm at the Valley Camp in Sault Ste. Marie, and I'm sitting with Paul Sabarin, a museum uh, curator and a tour guide all around Mr. Information, especially historical information about Sault Ste. Marie. Before the break, Paul, we were talking a little bit about uh, the Sioux Historic Sites and you mentioned the Tower of History. You also mentioned the river. Talk to us a little bit. When we say the Tower of History, just give us a, a picture of what that is. What does that look like? Okay. Well, the Tower of History, naturally, if you look up, way up, 210 feet nice. to be exact, then it is a cement structure next to the St. Mary's Cathedral. It has an elevator that can whisk you up 45 seconds. Thank you. Or, if you wish, <laughs> 292 steps Ooh. to take you to the top. And there's three observation platform. One is enclosed with displays and with information, with binoculars, and also an interactive marine traffic so that you know which ship you're able to see that's coming by on the St. Mary's River. The other side that we do have, and as I pointed out a little bit earlier, was the River of History Museum. Yes. And the river, again, as I say, is located downtown. It's our trifecta of history here for Sault Ste. Marie. You get a pretty good idea of the history of Sault Ste. Marie, and especially with the River of History. When you do walk in, you're handed a bateau, which has a recording, and you press on the various stations in order to get the history of the native Anishinaabek Chippewa Band of Ojibwe, of 
the fur traders of John Johnston, who married Oshika's God Awake the daughter of Chepwa Bejig. Ooh, I'm going to have trouble saying that one. Oshika's God Awake Way. Okay, I'll, I'll let you say that. <laughs> okay, well, John called her then Susan. Okay. Susan Johnson. Susan, I can say. Susan, you can say. And these are some of the houses, for instance, that are on Water Street right next to the Valley Camp, the original house of John Johnston. But let's get to the Valley Camp. The Valley Camp itself, 1917, in Lorain, Ohio. She was then launched. So that's when she was commissioned, was in 1917. Yep, 1917. Okay. Okay. That's when she was built and launched. And she was carrying coal, coal for all of the furnaces and coal for all of the locations that then produce metal. In 1955, she then was purchased by Republic Steel and named the Valley Camp to commemorate the Valley Camp Coal Company out of Pennsylvania. She sailed Ooh, okay. until 1966. And at that particular time, she is a coal-fired furnace, triple expansion steam engine. She was then decommissioned and laid up in Duluth. And this is when the Sioux Historic Site then made a purchase. From that particular time onward, as a nonprofit organization, we then develop all of the interior and exterior of the ship itself. Right. At this point here, we have in excess of about 150 models of ships that are inside the museum ship Valley Camp. We also have then this particular room that we're in right now. About four years ago, the shipping company and the Sioux Historic Site coordinated a, an approach to create an environmentally controlled room. And the reason is to be able to house the beautiful eagle that you see next to you. Yes, for our audience, if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, you can definitely see it, but that is definitely a work of art. So yes, talk to us about the eagle. Where did the eagle come from? Why is it significant? Well, the eagle itself was uh, 1873, was carved out of number of pieces of wood that was connected together, and it was put on the top of the pilot house of the Vienna. Okay. Now, the Vienna was a ship that sailed up till 1786, and during that particular time, it was foggy in Whitefish Bay, and it, it got struck by another ship. It was brought as far to the close to the shore as possible, but about two miles away from shore in Whitefish Bay, it sank. In the 70s, the in Department of Fisheries and Wildlife were doing some research, and the nets caught on to the fish. At that point, divers went down, and they were able to recover the eagle that we see right here. Beautiful. It was shared with a space that was environmentally controlled, at the Great Lake Shipwreck Historical Society in Whitefish Point. And once we were able to make this particular room here, which is the John P. Wellington Great Lakes Marine Hall of Fame. That's a mouthful. It is environmentally controlled. <laughs> it so is. So you can imagine right now, it's probably about 75 degrees outside. And right now, it is a cool 55 60 degrees with nice. lights and humidity. And with I'm loving that, it. Then the eagle landed and it came here back to the Valley Camp. What I would like to do is let's talk about like if I was going to bring a family here, like I've never been to the Valley Camp before, but this is going to be something cool. We can go in here. We can see a bunch of history. We can learn a lot about shipping through the Sioux Locks and the whole area. What could it, what could somebody expect when they come here? Well, when a family comes in, it could be uh, a family of one of 30,000 people during the six months that were open, nice. seven days a week from mid-May to the end of October. Then the children themselves from uh, up 
from eight years old to 17, our children's rate. Any younger, it's no admission charges. So the family can come in here, and the first thing that really the children are attracted to is the aquarium. We do have nice. fish that are swimming here. There's beautiful rainbow trouts. There's bluegills. And the kids really enjoy that particular one. Once they're down in the bottom of the ship itself, then there's an interactive area where they can be either the captain or the watchman or the <laughs> wheel person and pretty much steer the ship that they're in charge of. So those are some of the main attractions. But again, as I say, the history of all of the various maritime locations and the first lock in Sault Ste. Marie, we have a beautiful display. It's a model of the 1855 state lock that was built here in Sault Ste. Marie. We have models also of a few of the 13,000 footers. We have a model of the Walter J. McCarthy Jr. We have a model of the Carl D. Bradley. And with the Carl D. Bradley, that particular one is very good uh, presentation, but there is also something of very close interest, especially to our particular area, because in 58, in November of 58, the Carl D. Bradley broke in half. To give you a little bit of a background, the crew was ready for winter birth, and they got a call oh. when they were leaving Chicago and getting ready to go to Green Bay, and they say, you need to go and load up another load of limestone. So the captain changed the course, and the storm started brewing. And when it reached around the area of close to the Strait of Mackinac, then it broke in half. Ooh. Four of the sailors were tossed overboard along with the life raft, but the rest went down with the ship. It was 7.30 at night. It was November. It was a storm. And it was cold. And of the four that were there on the life raft, two of them froze to death. Oof. But two of them survived, Elmer Fleming and Frank May. It was 13 hours later that the U.S. Coast Guard was able to find them the next morning and save them. Since then, Elmer Fleming has passed away. He was a much older person. But Frank Mays was a gentleman who just passed away two years ago. Okay. But Frank wrote a book about his episode on the Carl D. Bradley. And three years ago, we had a young man from the Coast Guard, Andrew Tamlin Stemke from St. Ignace, okay. who wrote a script recruited all of the casts, and for three days in December, we were on top deck and also inside the museum ship Valacamp doing a movie documentary about the wreck of the Carl D. Bradley. <laughs> As you that can imagine, great. we are now in the final stage of setting it up, so it's going to be continuous in cargo hole number one, but if you're interested at this point here, going on YouTube and looking for trailers of The Man Long Forgotten. Man Long Forgotten, okay. Those are the indication that's going to be with the CD. There will be then production ongoing. But also, the other interesting thing is we have, as I mentioned, the lifeboat and the ring from the Edmund Fitzgerald. We also have a theater, or I should say two of them, that have the Fitzgerald controversy. It is the fourth. Ooh. Yes. There was the wreck, and there was the mystery. Now it is the controversy is the title of this one. It's an hour and 20 minutes. So if you spend time on the Valley Camp, and you're interested in learning all about the Edmund Fitzgerald, we have then this video that's running from opening to closing. And then you can pretty well listen to all of the interviews, 
listen to all of the documentation about the Fitzgerald and learn everything about the Fitz. Now, I, I do want to ask this question here, and I want the audience to actually look at it for themselves if they're into a good uh, controversy or mystery. But tell us a little bit, a little bit about why it is the controversy or what is the mystery. I usually answer it by saying I've got three answers. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, and I don't know. There we go. Thank you. So you got to watch the documentary for yourself. I got to watch the documentary yourself. because there was an investigation naturally that was carried out by the U.S. Coast Guard. Yes, and as within commonplace, whenever there's a yes. shipwreck or an airplane goes down or anything, there's always an investigation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the investigation is not conclusive, but it is a theory of what happened because nobody survived. And even the people, or the people, the sailors that were on the Arthur M. Anderson and Bernie Cooper, who was the captain in communication with Captain McSorley, they do not have any indication except to see what happened on that particular night of November the 10th, 1975. Oh, I love, 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 love a good mystery. Now I gotta, I know I gotta check it out. Uh, so Paul, if somebody is, uh, listening to this interview and they want to check out more of the Valley camp of, you know, the website, when you're open, how, how best they could plan their trip, what's the best way for them to find you, uh, you know, find you online, social media, whatever. Okay. If you have a GPS and you're in Sault Ste. Marie. Then 501 East Water Street, 501 East Water Street. This is our location of the ship store and the offices and the archives. And we're located right next to the famous Sulak boat tour and the Valley Camp on the water, naturally. Yes. The ship is floating. Only about a third of it is in the ground. So. The best way also is to log in and check our name of the organization, Sioux, S-A-U-L-T, historicsites.com. You'll be able then to see information about the Museum Ship Valley Camp, the Tower of History, the River of History, and also the Historic Home, which are located right next and they're owned by the city and manned by the docent from the Chippewa County Historical Society. Nice. So there's the history in a handful. And for our audience, uh, you can always go over to TotalMichigan.com, click on Paul's interview, and see the links that he mentioned uh, above. Uh, tune in next week for another exciting story about an ordinary Michigander doing some pretty extraordinary things. We'll see you then.